So what is the Trinity? It is the belief that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are one God. Perhaps the clearest definition of the Trinity can be found in the Athanasian Creed formulated by the church in the 4th century. The Athanasian Creed. I'm going to read excerpts of it. In your handout, you have more from it than what I'm able to put down, but I'm going to highlight certain things of it, certain aspects. The Athanasian Creed, taught by the churches since right about the 4th century, says, We worship one God in Trinity, neither confounding the persons nor dividing the substance. What that means is God is not one person, all one person, just operating so it's not confounding those persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, into one person. Nor is it dividing the substance. God is not divided into parts. So Jesus is not one, ha one third God, the Holy Spirit another third God, and the Father one third God. They are each individually in their person 100% God. I liken this a lot like a candle. If you have three candles and you light three flames you have three separate, distinct flames. You put those three flames together, and you can't tell what part is part of flame one, part of flame two, and what part is part of flame three. When you pull one flame away from the other two flames, that flame that you pull away is still 100% flame, whether it's functioning together with the other three or separately. God is spirit. We can't fully comprehend what spirit essence is. We can't fully comprehend what flame essence is. So in a lot of ways, we see in Romans that the, in, in, the invisible aspects of God are clearly seen in creation. It doesn't mean that God is creation, but that aspects of him are reflected in creation. And I see three candles, when you put those two together, reflect the aspect of the Trinity in, in a beautiful way. And so as the Athanasian Creed goes on, there is one person of the Father another of the Son, and another of the Holy Ghost. So the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Ghost is God, and yet there are not three gods, but one God. And in this trinity, none is before or after other, none is greater or less than another, but the whole three persons are co-eternal together and co-equal, so that in all things, as aforesaid, unity and trinity and trinity and unity is to be worshipped. Now this phrase, and in this trinity, none is before or after other, none is greater or less than other, is often quoted by the Jehovah's Witnesses. And they'll say, if the trinity teaches that none is greater or less than the other, why does Jesus say the Father is greater than I at John 14, 28? They don't tell you what the rest of the creed says to answer that. So you go a little farther down in the creed, and this is what you read. We believe and confess that our Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is God and man. God of the substance of the Father and man of the substance of his mother equal to the Father as touching his Godhood and inferior to the Father as touching his manhood. They never quote that part of the creed, which specifically answers the John 14, 28 question about the Father being greater than I. In his humanity, being on earth, the Father in full deity, and Jesus veiled his deity when he came to earth. He didn't relinquish it, and we'll get into that later, but he operated under the limitation of his humanity in most cases through, while he was on earth. And so in that sense, when he's operating under that limitation, the Father was greater than him. The Father was in heaven. He was on earth. That's a greater position as well. So in that sense, he's inferior to the Father. He's touching his manhood, but in his God nature, he's equal to God. Another way to look at this is, those of you who have children, raise your hand. All right, most of you. Your children 
are born into your family. They're, they're, you have sons, you have daughters, but they're not any less human than you are. In the same way, Jesus, as God's son, in his God nature, is not any less God than his father is. So, where did the Trinity doctrine come from? There were three heresies opposed by the early church. Before the Trinity doctrine was formulated, these heresies were coming in and out of the church. People would be teaching these various forms of the relationship of Christ to the Father, trying to reconcile the many scriptures that talk about that. How, how do you get your hands around that concept of the Father and the Son and, and, this, and what we were just talking about, some of the questions that are often asked? So there were three different viewpoints that were wrong that came into the early church. And the creed was not formulated till the 4th century because they had to hash out some of these differences and really figure out what the scriptures taught and come up with a formal doctrine about it. The doctrine of the Trinity, the concept of the Trinity, go back to the very beginning. Obviously, the apostles taught certain aspects of the Trinity foreshadow. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit um, were to baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so you saw certain things even in the scriptures, and then later on you see the early church fathers, which I don't have time to go into. My book on the Trinity at the back table, Yes, You Should Believe in the Trinity, goes into all that, and how the early church fathers prior to the Council of Nicaea and Council of Constantinople, where the Athanasian Creed came out of, the church fathers prior to that were teaching aspects of the Trinity, but it wasn't officially formulated until the 4th century. It was formulated in response to these three heresies. And the interesting thing that you're going to see here as I go through them is that these three same heresies exist today in our cults. The first one that we see in the early church was dynamic monarchianism. It was the belief that God existed in Jesus in a powerful way, but Jesus was not God himself. The problem with that viewpoint is it denies John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. God was the Word, as it says. And there's a many other scriptures that talk about Jesus being God. If God was in Jesus in a powerful way, he can't be God himself. It would just be having some divine essence on him. So it denies those, those aspects of Christ in scripture. So the early church shot that heresy down with the other scriptures support the deity of Christ, full deity of Christ. Another viewpoint in the early church was modalism. The idea that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are modes of one person, not three distinct persons. It is also called Sibelianism because Sibelius was the guy who first talked about this viewpoint. It denies Matthew 3, 16 through 17, which teaches the baptism of Jesus and you have three persons existing at once. If God is one person changing modes from Father to Son, then Son to Holy Spirit, and then Holy Spirit to Father, you can't have all three persons existing at once. Uh, as well, John 17 specifically says that Jesus was praying, and he was praying to the Father. If the Father and Jesus are the same person, then the Jehovah's Witness argument would stand against the Trinity if that's what it was taught because Jesus wasn't praying to himself. He was praying to the Father. And you have the distinctions of persons in that scripture. So modalism obviously was not correct according to scripture. The third heresy that came into the early church was tritheism, promoted primarily by a man named Arian, Arius. And it's called Arianism or also called polytheism because it's a form of polytheism. It's this idea that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are not only three distinct persons, but they're three distinct gods. The problem with that is it denies the scripture in Deuteronomy 6.4, the Hebrew Shema that every Jewish person learned growing up. Hear, O Israel, the Lord, Yahweh, our God is one Yahweh. You can't have three separate gods when you've got one Yahweh. 